What's up, YouTube? Welcome back to Celio's Network. My name is Luke, and today I am diving into the history of power creep in the Pokemon trading card game. The Pokemon trading card game has been around for over 20 years, and so we have seen so many different types of cards, different power levels, different mechanics, and we're going to be discussing all of that and looking at the power creep of the Pokemon trading card game today. Before we dive into this video, shout out to the sponsor of my channel, PotownStore.com, the best place for you to get PTCGO codes. Be sure to use code CELIO for 5% off when you're shopping at PotownStore.com for Pokemon TCG online codes. Uh, so these are the sources and credits I'll be referencing in this video. So shouts out to Bulbapedia.BulbaGarden.net, Jason Klazinski, Pokemon.WordPress.com, PTCG Archive, PokemonTCG.io, and also Pokebeach.com. Um, if you've never heard of any of these, uh, check out Bulbapedia for set lists, set releases, kind of like the facts about Pokemon TCG. Uh, J-Class Pokemon WordPress is the WordPress of a former three-time world champion, Jason Klazinski. And there's a ton of great information about older formats on that site. PTCG Archive has a lot of older deck lists ranging from 24, uh, 2004 to 2013, I believe, and they're always adding more deck lists. PokemonTCG.io, you can just look up any card you want for the images. And then PokeBeach.com is a great Pokemon news resource. This video will include line graphs comparing damage and HP on Pokemon cards from 1999 all the way to 2020, the timeline of mechanics in the Pokemon trading card game, the evolution of the big basic Pokemon in the Pokemon TCG, because some metagames and formats have been dominated by big basic Pokemon, and a lot of fans do not like that since evolution is such an important thing in Pokemon, and also theories on future power, power balancing. So first, let's start out with what is power creep and what does it look like in the Pokemon TCG? This is a quote from magicthegatheringfandom.com about power creep in card games. Uh, so the idea behind the concept is that a company has to sell its new products, but everything new they create has to compete with previously existing pieces. To compensate for this, cards end up becoming superior to other cards to the point of becoming strictly better. This means that older content becomes obsolete or relatively underpowered. So I do want to add a caveat to that. Not all the time do cards become inferior to other cards, uh, but a lot of times they do. So I want to look at a couple uh inferences in instances in the pokemon tcg here so mega manetric ex is a mega pokemon so it either ends your turn when evolves or needs a spirit link to evolve and galisopod gx over here on the right is a gx pokemon that just regularly evolves from a wimp pod so mega manetric ex came out in 2014 and galisopod gx came out in 2017 there's not a lot of noticeable power level difference between these cards they could in theory exist in the same format or metagame and Galisopod GX doesn't just outstandingly overpower Manectric EX, uh, Mega Manectric EX. Galisopod GX is not like that obviously overpowered compared to the Mane Mega Manectric on the left. But then when we look at these two cards paired together, Mewtwo EX, one of the first EX Pokemon cards ever back in 2003, and we look at Zacian V from 2019, there's no competition. You would never run a card like Mewtwo EX that can attach two energy cards to itself or do Cyburn for 60 while having 100 HP when you could just have Zacian V, which allows you to draw three cards, accelerate energy, swing 230 damage for three energy. Uh, there's just no competition there. So some of the power creep is uh, very minute. Some of the power creep is obvious. And the power creep between 2003 to 2020 has just been uh very very obvious there's been a lot of power creep over the two decades here um so here's just a quick look at the years i might reference or the sets that i may reference throughout this video and just if you wanted to know uh these are the years and formats referencing north american standard format so basically outside of japan these are the sets being released and being played throughout these years uh so let's start 
at the beginning 1999 through the year 2000 so we're dealing mostly with base set jungle and fossil here you'll see there's a kind of an obvious curve with the hp and damage of these pokemon scyther being a basic pokemon fully evolved in its basic form has 70 hp wigglytuff fully evolved at stage one has 80 hp and blastoise being fully evolved at stage two has 100 hp this is more or less the general curve of the HP. Now the damage you'll see on Scyther Swords Dance can make Slash do 60, but it would never naturally knock out another Scyther. Wigglytuffs do the wave maxes out at 60, so it would never naturally knock out another Wigglytuff. And Hydro Pump on Blastoise does a maximum of 60 damage naturally, so it would not one shot knock out another Blastoise. That's kind of the general power level of the 1999 through 2000 on Pokemon, if I had to just put it in one slide like I have here. In 2000 through 2001, what I have observed here is that they brought the HP of stage two Pokemon down just a little bit and the damage did not really go up at all but what they did was give them kind of unmeasurable features in the pokemon powers dark vile plumes pokemon power hay fever says no trainer cards can be played which is very very strong dark gengar's pokemon power deep sleep makes uh, players have to flip two heads to wake out uh, to wake up from the asleep condition while dark for alligators pokemon power scare turns off all of your opponent's baby pokemon powers and baby pokemon powers were very important in that era so in 2000 2001 what i see here is a little bit of a decrease in the hp of stage two but a big power increase on what the pokemon powers were doing in 2000 to 2001 baby pokemon and kind of support basics that weren't really trying to one shot each other and do big damage were very popular cleffa with the eek attack uh this is kind of like an iconic card of this era and baby pokemon had the rule on them if this baby pokemon is your active and your opponent tries to attack your opponent flips a coin if tails your opponent's turn ends without an attack but we also did have some strong basic Pokemon like Rockets Zapdos for four energy. It does 70 damage, and then it would do 10 times the number of lightning energy cards attached to it to itself. So it kind of had that proof in it that if this Rocket Zapdos went unchecked, it couldn't just use Electro Burn turn after turn. So while it was fairly strong, it had that kind of check within itself. So there were attacking basics, but there was also a lot of support basics like we see Cleffa here. In the early EX era 2003 through 2004, we also saw a lot of kind of support basic Pokemon, like the Stun Sparse with Strike and Run. Search your deck for up to three basic Pokemon and put them onto your bench. Uh, so this was really good to use turn one, and in the 2004 rules, you can attack going first. So getting off a Strike and Run going first, you are able to attach, use this attack at three of your basic Pokemon, is a very strong start in that format. Uh, the Gardevoir here, I thought this was a really good non-EX stage one to show. Uh, since it has a pretty decent attack for one energy, it does 10 damage times the total amount of energy attached to Gardevoir and the defending Pokemon, but it also allows you to accelerate a psychic energy from your deck to one of your pokemon and it has to put two damage counters on that pokemon septile ex over here on the right however is a great example of ex stage twos with 150 hp and it can deal a maximum of 100 damage but for five energy and then it can't use slashing strike during your next turn so fairly strong but it has its drawback and it is worth two prizes when knocked out so let's look at some 2004 worlds lists to get you guys a good idea of what a Pokemon deck might have looked like back in 2004. This is Chris Fulop's second place 2004 Blaziken deck, and it was built around an attacking stage two. Blaziken EX is the main attacker, but Blaziken non EX also has a good attack and a very strong Poke power that supports Blaziken EX. It has a tech stage two line of Oddish Blossom, which can be rare candy down, so there's no middle stage there and it has multiple stage one lines in delcaddy and Manetric for support it has one attacking quote big basic pokemon which is the rayquaza ex with 100 hp but as you can see the basic pokemon like dunsparce are mostly being used for support 
another 2004 worlds list we'll see some similar things it's built around an attacking stage 2 gardevoir ex it has the support gardevoir but gardevoir non-ex can also attack it has multiple stage 1 lines delcaddy and magneton and there are zero basics in this deck that are included with the purpose of dealing damage Lastly, we'll look at the Magma deck, which won 2004 Worlds in all divisions. Although it was built around two strong basic attackers, this deck was optimal with the help of its Stage 1 Pokemon, Team Magma's Claydol and Team Magma's Camerupt. And although it was a more aggressive, basic-focused deck, Team Magma's Groudon and Team Magma's Zangoose were not one-shotting each other or one-shotting things that are not weak to it. Let's look at the 2005 world standings. We have, you'll see a lot of stage two Pokemon doing well. We have Nidoqueen, Titar, Nidoqueen, Titar, Titar, and then Ludicolo in eighth place. The sixth and seventh places were both stage one focused decks, but altogether evolution Pokemon decks that are taking a while to set up uh, and they're really focusing on that core concept of evolving to get to the strongest stage of Pokemon. And these are just some of those Pokemon that were included, like Metacham EX and Dark Tyranitar. So you can see kind of the power level they were at. In 2010, we did have Pokemon SP Level X, which uh, kind of did have to evolve, but they were going from Luxray SP to Luxray SP Level X. Uh, but they were worth one prize card, the Level X Pokemon. And there were still a lot of evolution Pokemon coexisting with these basic level X's at the time. We see Guardi Gallade with Machamp in second place there. Frank Diaz's iconic Curse Guard deck. Um, Gyarados, another Guardi Gallade. And Miguel Garcia's Lux Chomp deck did have an Entei Raikou Legend piece, which is what I would call a big basic, but I think they balanced these Legend Pokemon so well. What a Legend Pokemon was, as you'll see Rayquaza Deoxys Legend here, it is a Pokemon worth two prizes, and it has higher HP and higher damage output than the other basic Pokemon of the time, but you had to have two separate cards, the top piece and the bottom piece, and you had to play them down together to get Rayquaza Deoxys Legend onto the board. So I think they were balanced really well, and you can kind of see here the power level of the Stage 2 Gengar, 110 HP, 60 damage, spreads a little bit of damage as well, and the Luxury GL Level X having 110 HP but only doing 60 damage with its attack. 2013 world standings however if we fast forward a little bit 2013 was dominated by big basic pokemon which i don't personally enjoy and i know a lot of the community doesn't personally enjoy either i think in 2012 when big basic ex pokemon came back we kind of had this problem with the power level of basic pokemon because they took up less deck space because they didn't have to evolve they took less time to set up and they were doing too much damage for that advantage of speed that they have kind of leaving stage one and stage two and even a lot of non-ex basic pokemon not really being used as attacking pokemon we see cards like Darkrai EX being one of the main attackers in decks and Curum being a main attacker in the Plasma decks, but support evolutions like Garbodor and Blastoise really being mostly the only evolutions being played. There were not a ton of attacking evolutions and decks that had to evolve their Pokemon to actually start making progress. However, let's go forward four years to the World Championships 2017, and this is what I consider to be the golden age of modern Pokemon TCG. We had so many evolution decks and a lot of unique uh, decks and differing evolution lines within the decks. We have Gardevoir, which also includes Octillery and Gallade. We have Galisopod Garbodor, Espeon Garbodor, Drampa Garbodor. So Garbodor was around a lot, but there were also other decks in this format as well like Decidueye and Alolan Ninetales GX. And I think the Sun and Moon era of GX has really brought a good balance of power to the game. Although you will see these cards are much, much more stronger than the Stage 2 Pokemon we were looking at from the 2004 era, uh, I think these brought a better balance than the big basic EX era of like 2012 to 2015 brought to us. However, if we fast forward again three more years to 2020, an online event might look like this one where it's mostly dominated by big basic 
GX Pokemon, multiple prize Pokemon. There are actually no evolutions shown in this top eight standings. And these are some of the most dominant Pokemon. We have the tag teams like Picaram and ADP. And we do have evolution Pokemon like Eternatus VMAX, but the power level is drastically crept up from those Pokemon we were looking at just a few moments ago. And then some of the only single prize basic Pokemon you'll see played are things like Blacephalon because they can one shot these monster Pokemon. So on this slide, I have a spreadsheet I made out of estimations of what the typical HP and damage for a meta performing Pokemon card would be in that year. So like we see in the year 1999, I have the basic HP being 70 and the basic damage being 60 for a strong meta Pokemon. And I looked at Scyther from Jungle for that statistic. And going down the line, you'll see that. And you can pause here and look at this sheet all you want. Um, but I don't want to bore too many people with all the numbers. So we're going to go over to graphs to depict these numbers a little bit easier. Now, if I do put all of these numbers that I've estimated to be the typical numbers that a Pokemon needs to meet to be meta defining or strong in the metagame in that year's standard format, the line graph looks like this. And... Honestly, it's a bit of a mess, so I'm going to water it down a little bit for you all. So this line graph that you see here is all of the HP numbers from that previous spreadsheet that I showed you. So the ones I really want to look at here first are the basic multiprizer HP and the stage one multiprizer HP. The basic multiprizer HP is depicted by this dashed black line. So it starts down here all the way in 2003 at about 100 HP, like that Mewtwo EX we looked at from Ruby Sapphire. And by the time those basic EXs were gone for a little bit, from 2003 to 2006, the typical HP for basic multi-prize Pokemon barely even went up in those three or so years. You'll see here um, when basic multi-prize Pokemon were reintroduced with the legend pieces in 2010, you'll see they're at about 150 HP for the typical succeeding legend pieces. So they didn't really go up too much if you compare it with the rest of the power creep that was happening. I think 150 is a reasonable number for them to be at. And I think we can just look back at history and see that they weren't dominating because of the checks that were put into those Pokemon. They were worth two prizes. You had to have two in your hand to play it down. I think they were fine. And then in 2012, when multi-prize basics come back, uh, this line would reconnect here at uh, the higher end of between 150 and 200, so about 160 HP being the typical uh, for big basic multi-prizers. And in 2012, we have that, and it goes down and stays about even up until uh, 2018 to 2019, where we just have an incredible spike from 2018 to 2019, going all the way up past 250 HP. And that is due to the tag team Pokemon that were re released in Team Up, Unbroken Bonds, Unified Minds, and Cosmic Eclipse sets in the Sun and Moon era. Um, and then I personally believe this spike from the tag teams causing that basic multiprizer HP to go up so high then caused a ripple effect because you'll see the stage one multiprizer HP, which was staying even for like five years from late 2013 all the way to 2019. And then it just spikes with the VMAX Pokemon. And I think that ripple effect is caused by the high basic multiprizer HP being crept up so much. A couple things to just take note of, you'll see that the stage two HP and the stage one, uh, the stage one HP and the stage two HP really don't change much. They they do go up a little bit, but they're nowhere near being able to compete with the basic multiprizers and the stage one multiprizers. Now here, if we look at the estimated damage by year from that spreadsheet, let's again focus on the basic multiprizer damage and the stage one multiprizer damage. 
So the basic multi-prizer damage back in 2003, we actually see the typical attackers in the meta that were basic multi-prize go down just a little bit from 2003 to 2006. So the damage they were doing might have been put down a little bit, but maybe their abilities were a little better. Like we saw with the Team Rocket and Neo Stage 2 Pokemon, their HP and damage weren't that impressive, but they had really strong abilities. Again, the basic multi-prizers come back in 2010 with the Legend pieces, being around 100 for a typical attack from them. And then in 2012, uh, the basic EXs come in, dealing about 80 to 90 damage on average, and a steep increase of the basic, uh, basic multi-prizer damage output happened around 2015. And in 2012 to 2015, like I was saying, it was very dominated not dominated by the big basic pokemon um and then it's just an increase from there on and it never really stopped going up as for the stage one multi-prizer damage however it also peaked in 2015 for a little bit um, and this was around the era of the mega ex pokemon because they had to make them stronger than the basic pokemon of course and it kind of reset itself in 2017 with the Sun and Moon GX era, which again, I think is one of the best eras of the modern Pokemon TCG. And it was staying so balanced. It was staying balanced again until tag teams came out and we had to make these VMAX Pokemon try to do better than them. And they barely even hit the market doing better than the tag team Pokemon on average. So here we're going to look at the basic multi-prize Pokemon over time. Back in 2003, the introduction of basic multi-prize Pokemon was the Ruby and Sapphire EXs. So we'll just take a look at Mewtwo EX here. Then they, uh, they continued until 2006 and stopped. In 2010, basic multi-prize Pokemon were reintroduced just for a brief moment with the Legend pieces, which we already looked at Rayquaza and Deoxys Legend. In 2012, one of the most iconic EX Pokemon of that time, other than Mewtwo EX, was Darkrai EX, with 180 HP and doing Night Spear for 90 damage. Looking at that compared to Mewtwo EX from back in 2003, there's no competition. Six years later, Zeraora GX, honestly, it's not that much powerful, more powerful compared to Darkrai EX. Now, it does do more damage with its Plasma Fist's attack, but it can't use it twice in a row. Its HP isn't that much better. It has almost the same ability. Uh, they, this was a really great showing of that they were able to introduce a new mechanic in GX Pokemon but dial it back a little bit and still have them be successful. However, I believe they've really messed that up in 2019 with the Tag Team Pokemon, which just blows everything else on this chart out of the water. Tag Team Pokemon, I think, definitely should have been something like the Legend pieces that have to be connected by two cards. Um, and then in 2020, the V Pokemon, again, they dial it back. You'll notice that Bolt Tund V and Zeraora GX and Darkrai EX aren't staggeringly different in their face statistics. The mechanics over time, we'll look at this timeline. Back in 2003-2004, the Swampert EX showing for the EX mechanic. In 2007, we have the Level X mechanic introduced, which I think was really great because these Pokemon were not worth multiple prizes. They weren't incredibly power crept, but they were strong for being another evolution. Torterra was basically a stage 3 Pokemon because you had to go from Turtwig to uh, Grotile, I believe. That's the name, yeah. Torterra and then Torterra level X. Don't hate me if I got the middle stage of Torterra wrong. And then Luxray GL level X represents the introduction of the SP Pokemon and the SP level X Pokemon. And then Yen Mega Prime, of course, representing the introduction of Prime Pokemon. And Prime Pokemon technically were not a mechanic because they did not reward extra prize cards, but they were kind of the more strong, iconic Pokemon of the 2011 era. And I think from 2003 to 2011, those were some of my favorite, most enjoyable eras of the game. Even looking back now playing in those formats, I really, really enjoy those formats because they're thought provoking. The games are slower. And after 2007, up until uh, 2011, the only multiple prize Pokemon that were introduced were the legend pieces. And that was so briefly that they were even in the game. 
However, we go to 2012 to 2015, uh, looking at Evil Tall EX, Genesect EX, and Mewtwo EX, this was a big basic heavy and evolution lacking time in the Pokemon game. And while I still played the Pokemon TCG in this time and I still enjoyed myself, I think it was less rewarding and less interesting than a time when, say, 2004 or 2007, when most decks were relying on their evolution Pokemon or decks that were all basics were noticeably weaker or at a disadvantage if your opponent could get out all of their evolution Pokemon. However, in 2017, I think they successfully fixed that and they got evolution Pokemon back in business with things like Golisopod GX Garbodor from Guardians Rising and Gardevoir GX from Burning Shadows. Although they were multi-price Pokemon, they were fairly balanced and they made the game have that evolution aspect that is so important to the Pokemon franchise. So this, in this slide, I wanted to depict how I think they made that successful transition from big basics dominating to evolutions again. And I think a big help was the mega evolution period in 2015, 2016, because they were the stronger EX Pokemon that went on top of an already strong EX Pokemon, but you technically did have to evolve them to get there. And they had the mega evolution rule, which made you use spirit links as well. So they were very strong, but if you could pull it off, they would commonly overpower the weaker EX Pokemon like Genesect, Evil Tom, Mewtwo. I do think this helped them transition into this Sun and Moon era, which I so fondly recall as being a great time. And even now, building these old format decks from 2017, 2018, I enjoy them so much more than the current state of the game. So I wanted to compare that to what's going on right now in the Pokemon TCG, which we have these tag teams that were dominating, and they introduced the VMAX Pokemon, which are three prize Pokemon as well, and their massive HPs, massive damages, are trying to overpower the tag teams. While they only sometimes overpower the tag teams, I think they are that gateway between a big basic dominated format to a format where evolution might matter again and they'll be able to dial back the power creep. So I'm kind of saying that VMAXs could be in this equation equal to what the Megas were in the transition from the secondary EX era to the Sun and Moon early GX era, which was so good and so balanced. Of course, we do have on the horizon the Battle Styles set. These scans are from Pokebeach.com, and I do think they're dialing back the power a little bit and adding some interesting abilities and mechanics on Evolution Pokemon. It does feel like they're really trying to push the idea of support Evolution Pokemon to support your big multi-prizers, which I think is a good path to take to segue into Evolution Attackers even being important again in the Pokemon TCG. So I hope you enjoyed this video and thank you for watching. Uh, please leave your comments and opinions down below so I can read them and hear what you have to think. Let me know if there's anything I missed or messed up on, but I did a lot of research for this video and a lot of preparation to try to portray and present all of the facts, opinions, and my estimated data for the power creep of the Pokemon trading card game from 1999 to 2020. So like I said, I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to subscribe to the channel or full the channel for daily Pokemon TCG content and check out my sponsor potownstore.com for all of your PTCGO needs. Have a great day and I'll see you next time here on Celio's Network.